want to thank you for coming. My name is Andrew Calvo. I'm the marketing director for Post Carbon Institute. Today, Richard Heimberg will be presenting uh, a talk that uh, he's given uh, just once recently, and this, he's actually given a little take for, for Google on this, on sustainability and resource depletion. Richard is a senior fellow at Post Carbon Institute. He has written eight books. The last four have been on energy, on peak oil, uh, primarily. And he was, for 10 years, a member of the core faculty at the New College uh, in the Santa Rosa campus. And he's recognized as one of the world's leading peak oil educators. So, Richard? Well, thank you. It's really uh, uh, a pleasure to be here at the Google campus. And uh, what I'd like to do over the course of the next 40 minutes is talk a bit about sustainability in perhaps more uh, depth than most of us are accustomed to thinking of it. And looking at sustainability, particularly with regard to uh, natural resources, both renewable and non-renewable. Uh, over the course of the past uh, couple of years, I've gotten interested in uh, the word sustainability, how it's become sort of a buzzword that we tack on to everything, including you know, sustainable profits, sustainable rates of return, sustainable growth, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, <clears throat> wanted to uh, see if there were any essential uh, aspects of, uh, of the definition of this word that, that we could learn from in a, applying to social systems in general. Uh, so in, in tracking down the, the history of sustainability, of course, uh, it was necessary to start at the very beginning, which turns out to be in Western European literature back around 1712 with the very first appearance in the literature of the idea of sustainable forestry. Of course, uh, non-European peoples, indigenous peoples, have had uh, sustainability as part of their uh, world view for a very long time. Famously, Native Americans did things with the seventh generation in the future in mind, made, made their decisions. Uh, the definition of sustainability that probably most people are familiar with these days was one that came out in 1987 in, in the Brundtland Report that uh, described sustainable development as development that meets current needs without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet theirs. That's very good, but um, in my view, it's inadequate because it really doesn't uh, tell us very much about what makes uh, an activity sustainable. Um, so after uh, months of search in the literature, and there are, if you go on Amazon, there are something like 20,000 books with sustainability in their title in one way or another. I do not claim to have even become familiar with all of those, much less to have read them all. But um, in looking at the surveys of the surveys to see you know, who has actually tried to get to the bottom of what sustainability is all about, I found that uh, there are some ideas that recur again and again. And I've been able to summarize those in four simple axioms that uh, I think if we took to heart would actually change our society pretty fundamentally. Uh, the first axiom that I thought it was important to uh, include uh, actually doesn't explain what sustainability is except in terms of its absence. Um, we know that most complex societies, most civilizations in the past have collapsed. And uh, in just about every instance, we can trace that collapse to some way in which the society was not uh, functioning very rationally with regard to its resource base. Now, collapse is, uh, is, is virtually the opposite of sustainability. I mean, the, the essence of sustainability is, you know, what can we continue to do over time? So if a society has collapsed, obviously, they have not continued to do things that they were previously doing. Uh, the best book on the subject is one that was published in the late 1980s uh, by Joseph Tainter, who's an uh, archaeologist in the uh, American Southwest, a book called The Collapse of Complex Societies. And in it, he, uh, 
he tied social complexity to the effort to solve societal problems. Now, given language and our tool making ability, it was more or less inevitable that we would create complex societies. And we did so in order to solve specific problems like um, feeding more people. Uh, so we developed agriculture, and agriculture led to full-time division of labor. And full-time division, full division of labor is really the essence of societal complexity. But as Tainter points out in his book, the effort to develop societal complexity to solve social problems tends to yield diminishing returns over time. So the very first uh, investments in complexity, say in agriculture, tend to yield large returns. But then over time, well, just with agriculture, we see uh, soil degradation, uh, erosion, and so on. And uh, eventually, unless the society develops other ways of uh, dealing with those problems, uh, it faces collapse. So. <clears throat> What axiom one does, in my mind, is underscore that the notion that what we're talking about with regard to sustainability is not just um, a matter of being eco-friendly. Sustainability ultimately is about survival. It's about the, the survival of a society. And so it's very serious. It should be right at the center of our uh, public agenda. Axiom two has to do with growth. And it states simply, population growth and or growth in rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. Uh, on the face of it, that sounds uh, pretty harsh. Uh, after all, we have had population growth over the past, uh, well, actually over the past millennia, but particularly over the course of the past couple of centuries. And we have had growth in rates of consumption. And we're still here. Well, the, the, uh, the axiom doesn't say that you can't do these things temporarily. What it says is that you can't do them continually. Uh, and simple arithmetic pretty much proves this. Um, let's say you have a 1% rate of population growth. That means the population is going to double every 70 years. Uh, suppose. Uh, you start with a population of, of 1 billion. After 70 years, it's 2 billion. After 140 years, it's 4 billion. Uh, 210 years, it's 8 billion, and so on. And this, this kind of growth, doubling every, uh, every so often, uh, achieves astonishing numbers in relatively small periods of time. Um, Think, for example, of China's consumption of coal. China is consuming about 250 billion tons of coal per year currently, uh, which is about twice what the US is consuming. Uh, China's rate of consumption is growing about 7% per year currently. So that means that uh, China's coal consumption is doubling every 10 years. Well, what, is, what does this mean in terms of, well, first of all, climate change? Obviously, the implications are horrendous. But then what does it mean in terms of the amount of coal that China actually has to burn? I mean, clearly, there's an enormous amount of the resource in place. But if your consumption is doubling every 10 years, even an enormous amount shrinks away pretty rapidly. So here we are. This is the obviously the the graph of human population, we reached 1 billion in 1820, 2 billion in 1930, 3 billion uh, in the 19, uh, early 1960s, 4 billion by the late 70s, 5 billion by the late 80s, 6 billion by 1998, and we're up to uh, something like 6.7 billion human beings on the planet currently. How many human beings can planet Earth sustain? No one knows the answer to that question, but we may be about to find out. Axiom three has to do with renewable resources. And this gets right back to the, uh, the original use of the term back in the 18th century with regard to sustainable forestry. 
to be sustainable, the use of renewable resources has to proceed at a rate that's less than or equal to that of natural replenishment. And of course, you're much better off if your rate of consumption of renewable resources is considerably less than the rate of natural replenishment because the rate of natural replenishment of renewable resources is variable due to weather and other factors. And if we're using those resources at the absolute maximum rate, then we're likely to get into trouble. We're likely to uh, find ourselves actually reducing the sustainability of that, that resource base. Well, are we uh, following Axiom 3 in the world currently? Uh, no, not with regard to many resources. Uh, this graph here, of course, is marine fish catch. And most of the world's uh, fisheries are uh, at the point of uh, uh, overconsumption, if not exhaustion. Um, but that's only one example. Uh, the world's forest cover is shrinking by an area equivalent to the size of Ireland every year. Uh, these, are, these are trends, obviously, that can't continue very long. This is a, a fairly obvious lesson that we haven't yet learned. Axiom 4 has to do with non-renewable resources. Um, now, it should stand to reason that there is no sustainable rate of consumption of non-renewable resources. I mean, if we're using them once, for all, once and for all, as in burning them, uh, there is no sustainable rate. Um, <clears throat> if we can recycle them, then uh, one could argue that it's, it's then still possible to use non-renewable resources. But uh, in the case of non-renewable resources that are actually consumed, that, that can't be fully recycled, the only way we, we can approach a condition of sustainability is if the rate of consumption is declining. And the rate of decline has to be substantial. It has to be at least equal to or greater than the rate of depletion. Well, what does this mean? Example, uh, oil production. The world has something like a trillion barrels of oil reserves. That's the amount of oil we think we'll be able to extract in the future. Uh, at current prices using current technology. We're consuming something like uh, two to two and a half percent of that trillion barrels on an annual basis. So in order to have something like a sustainable relationship with petroleum, we'd have to be reducing our rate of consumption of oil at about two and a half percent per year. And in that case, by the time we really got to a point where we were literally running out, we will, we will have already voluntarily reduced our reliance on oil to such a point that it won't make any difference. Um, that's not what we're doing, of course. We're increasing our reliance on oil. We're increasing our demand for petroleum and petroleum products on an annual basis. And uh, this is um, a subject that I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail because it's one that I, I happen to be fairly familiar with as a result of 10 years of, of study and analysis and talking to people in the oil industry and, uh, and seeing some uh, forecasts that a number of us have been making fulfilled as time goes on. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the term peak oil, the idea that world oil production will reach a maximum at some point and then begin to decline. We know it's going to happen because it's already happened here in the U.S. The U.S. is a post-peak oil country. Our domestic uh, oil production peaked around 1970. Uh, Discovery peaked in 1930, has been declining ever since. And so uh, what used to be the epicenter of the world oil industry is now a country that imports two-thirds of the oil that it uses. And we are by far the world's champion oil importing nation. Uh, numbers two and three are China and Japan. And we import about twice as much as China and Japan combined. So here we are. Um, why have gasoline prices gotten so high lately? Well, first of all, it's, it's surprised a lot of people. Uh, here's the uh, U.S. Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration in, two, in 2006 uh, telling us that in the high price case forecast, we might get up to $100 a barrel for oil by 2030. 
Uh, in the low price case, we could look forward to $35 a barrel oil all the way out to 2030. Uh, well, there were a lot of us who th at, at that time thought that that was a very unrealistic forecast, but just how unrealistic was, of course, underscored just this past year. We got up to $147 a barrel uh, in July 2008. That wasn't supposed to happen until sometime in the middle of the century. Uh, here's CNN Money telling us that the, the consensus of analysts is that oil won't hit $100 a barrel which is about where it is right now. Well, what's brought us to this point, obviously the falling value of the dollar has had some uh, role to play, speculation in oil uh, futures has had a role to play, rising demand. Very often the rising demand is, is uh, attributed to countries like China and India, and it's true that oil demand is increasing in those countries, but for uh, reasons I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, I think the more important rising demand is not in China and India, but actually in the oil exporting countries like Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Russia, and so on. But meanwhile, th these first three are what the, the uh, commentators tend to focus on. The last one is seldom discussed, and that's the fact that supply has been pretty much static for the past four years. <clears throat> this is the uh, best uh, definition of peak oil that I've ever seen. It's from my friend uh, Chris Skrobowski, who's the editor of Petroleum Review in London. Uh, he puts it in terms of a kind of seesaw or teeter-totter effect. Uh, countries that are past peak, like the U.S., and most countries that produce oil have already passed their all-time oil production peaks. Uh, Past peak countries are seeing declines in production. So in order just to stay even, there have to be other countries that are increasing their rate of production just so we stay even. So the point in time when we reach peak oil is the time when the decliners outweigh the advancers, when it's no longer possible for countries that are producing more oil on an annual basis to make up for those that are uh, headed south. Well, we should keep this in mind when we hear about new sources of oil in the world. Um, we hear about Brazil's uh, good luck in finding oil on the outer continental shelf uh, in that part of the world. There have been some new finds in the Gulf of Mexico in the last couple of years. We hear about good luck in the back and shale in Montana. We hear that there might be 50 billion barrels of oil in the Arctic regions of, of the planet that we might be able to access in the future. Well, that looks really good if we can simply add all of that new oil to what we're producing today. But the reality is we have to take account first of the declines before we can make these additions. And we are seeing substantial declines, and the rate of decline is growing. Uh, we just heard this year that Russia's oil output has reached its maximum and has been headed down for the past six to eight months. That's extremely important because Russia has been the main source of non-OPEC oil production growth for the past decade. So outside of OPEC, there's very little new oil coming online these days. Uh, Nigeria is having trouble, not just from a, because of geology, but also because of, uh, of local politics maintaining their uh, uh, rate of production. Mexico's oil production is declining rapidly. Its, uh, its star oil field, Cantarell, which is the world's third largest oil field, peaked about four years ago. And now Cantarell's production is declining at about 30% per year. So this, is, this creates a daunting challenge for, for the world oil industry to make up for those declines and actually create advances. Now this is the scorecard for 2007. Um, <clears throat> on the left side are new additions to supply and, and on the right side are, uh, are declines. 
And as we can see, Mexico is a big decliner. Saudi Arabia was a decliner in, in 2007. Now, the Saudis are saying, of course, that was entirely voluntary. It had nothing to do with geology. But uh, for pretty much all of the rest of these, it's, it's a matter of depletion of those oil, old oil fields that were discovered back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. The days when we were finding gi giant and supergiant oil fields. Today, what are found typically are much smaller fields in much more out of the way places, places that, that are more expensive and difficult to operate in. So that was last year's scorecard. Actually, the same thing happened in 2006. The decliners outweighed the advancers. Uh, again, why are oil prices so high? Well, this fundamentally, I would say, is at the heart of, uh, of the reason. So this is what uh, actual crude oil production has looked like for the past few years. We've been on a sort of treadmill since about 19, uh, or excuse me, 2005. Uh, things have looked a little bit better in 2008, and there are some substantial new oil production projects coming online in uh, 2009, 2010. The question is, will they be able to make up for the accelerating decline rate from more and more countries that are going over the top. Every year, there are fewer oil exporters and more oil importers. Um, meanwhile, I mentioned earlier that uh, oil demand is growing, especially among the oil exporting countries. So even as total production has remained flat and, in fact, increased a little bit in the last year, net exports have started to decline. Countries that export oil first have to satisfy domestic demand before they can sell oil on the market. Now, Saudi Arabia's domestic demand for oil is growing at about 7% per year, which means that it's doubling every 10 years. At that rate, even if Saudi is able to maintain current output, it will cease to be a net exporter sometime around 2030. Now, there are questions as to whether Saudi Arabia will be able to maintain its current rate of output. Uh, but the, the export dilemma is, is an added difficulty on top of that. Uh, this next slide is a little complicated, but it, it's worth taking a moment to look at. This is a, a wiki project on the part of a number of petroleum experts, actually dozens of petroleum experts around the world. And what they've done is, uh, uh, first of all, look at all of the new production projects that are coming online um, historically and in the next few years. Uh, <clears throat> what will be their maximum rate of flow? Where are they? Uh, and then what will be the decline rate from existing fields. And then on top of that, they have added in projected rates of increase of domestic demand for oil in those oil producing nations. And what they've come up with is a chart of world oil net exports, history, and future projection. And as you can see, it looks as though global oil net exports peaked in 2005. And whether we're actually reaching technical global peak oil now or next year or the year after that or in five years' time, in some ways is um, beside the point. For countries like the United States that rely on imported oil, because what we rely on is not just one total figure of global production. What we need is oil that we can buy on the global market. And that is clearly about to head over a cliff. So why have oil prices softened in the last uh, six weeks? Well, uh, essentially, volatility in price is something that those of us who have been talking about peak oil for the past decade have predicted. That's, this is, as, uh, as necessary commodities become scarce, their price tends to fluctuate ever more wildly. 
So what, what's actually happened since July is that uh, the very high prices, getting up close to $150 a barrel for oil, uh, resulted in uh, serious economic pain for the American and global economy. Uh, Americans started driving less, using more public transportation. The airline industry started grounding planes, cutting routes. Uh, farmers found that they were having trouble affording the crop inputs and fuel for their tractors. This is not just in the US, but around the world. Countries that had be, been using diesel fuel to generate electricity started keeping the lights on, not 24 hours a day, but maybe only six or 10 hours a day. So this balanced the books. As a result of demand and destruction, we were able to actually reduce world demand for oil over the past uh, few months particularly over the last six weeks or so. And that successfully brought the price down. Now, of course, this has coincided with some other economic problems having to do with uh, uh, <clears throat> some uh, subprime uh, credit crunch. I see a few headlines in the newspapers. I'm not sure what that's about. But um, supposedly, that's a big deal. I don't know. So anyway, that, that has also killed some oil demand and also led oil futures traders to believe that uh, demand for oil in months ahead is likely to be lower. So that's brought down the price. Meanwhile, global supplies of oil haven't really changed. And amounts available for export have actually declined. This has all become a big political issue, of course, and uh, we're told that we can solve our problems just by drill, drilling here and drilling now. The absurdity of that is, becomes apparent when you look into the history of oil exploration and production in the United States. We are the world's most mature oil producing province here in this country. More oil wells have been drilled in North America than in the rest of the world put together. So what we have left to produce on the Outer Continental Shelf and in Anwar and a few other places are really the dregs, the absolute dregs. Um, a study was done at Rice University looking at you know, using the, the most robust estimates of how much was out there to be, to be produced and then looking at how much time it would take to bring it on stream and so on. And you can see what, uh, what an influence this is likely to have. Um, the red dots are, of course, actual production of U.S. oil. And, and as you can see, by the time we get any substantial rate of flow, it, again, in the best case scenario, from these uh, off-limits areas, we're looking at something like 2035, 2040. And by that time, production from existing oil fields in the U.S. will have declined uh, by about half of what they are today. And this new oil won't even be enough to lift production back up to where it is today. So forget about uh, drilling for oil in the US as a way of uh, making the country independent of oil imports or even imports from the Middle East. We, it, assuming that our demand for oil is the same 20 years from now as it is today, we will be importing more even if we drill everywhere. So the only effective remedy for the problem is reducing demand. As we've seen over the past weeks, that's the only thing that's actually lowered oil prices. It's the only thing that's likely to oil, lower oil prices in the future. We have to find alternatives to oil. We have to stop using as much petroleum. Well, what are some alternatives? We could make uh, liquid fuel from coal. And the US uh, Defense Department is busy trying to uh, build some uh, coal to liquids power plants to do exactly that, to make fuel for military aircraft. After all, we can't rely on oil from the Middle East to power our jet fighters to that, whose main mission will presumably be to protect oil from the Middle East in situations where that's in question. So we have to have some other sources. And uh, coal to liquids could work. Um, unfortunately, that's very expensive technology. It's only been developed historically twice 
once in uh, Nazi Germany and the other time in uh, uh, apartheid South Africa, both in situations where there were embargoes against the import of regular conventional oil. That was the only way that this, this production of this stuff could have been cost effective. It has very low energy return on energy investment. Uh, it's very dirty process. Um, and coal supplies, in any case, have been wildly overestimated globally. I'm, I'm in the process of uh, finishing up a book on global coal supplies. The title is Blackout. Uh, it'll be coming out in the spring. Essentially, um, we've all been told that the world has a couple of hundred years worth of coal. Uh, but we can't trust statements like that. Uh, the, the very form of the statement, we have 200 years worth, implies that you know, we can continue using coal at, at some arbitrary rate, and then one day it just all runs out and it stops. Whereas, in fact, we know that with every non-renewable resource, there's a kind of a bell curve of recovery. We get the cheap, easy stuff first. We grow consumption until we can't grow it anymore, and then it declines slowly over a long period of time. That's what peak oil is all about. Peak coal is exactly the same kind of phenomenon, and it will happen. So who's doing studies on when global coal supplies will actually peak? The US Department of Energy isn't doing such studies. It turns out that just over the last three years, the very first peaking studies for global coal have come out, and they have uh, uh, concurred in their forecast of a global peak in coal production around 2035 to th 2040. So that's a lot less than 200 years, and it's well within the planning horizon of any, of any new coal power plant we'd be building today. So coal prices have doubled over the past two years. They're going to continue on their way up as we, go to, uh, as we move toward 2030, 2040. The price of coal is going to increase, both because of scarcity, because we are exhausting the highest quality resources first, and also because we transport coal using oil. Whether it's in a ship, uh, on a train, or in a truck, we transport coal using uh, either bunker oil or diesel fuel. And as that fuel gets more expensive, the price of coal goes up. Very often, the price of delivered coal at the power plant is up, uh, consists of up to 70% transport costs, in some cases more. So making liquid fuels from coal, it will happen, but not on a very large scale. Um, I won't take as long talking about biofuels because uh, the, the great rush to corn ethanol has, has turned into a bust. Uh, the pr price of corn advanced so high over the past year that now the ethanol distilleries are operating at a loss. Corn's too expensive. Even with gasoline prices as high as they are, the price of corn is so high. And part of the reason the price of corn is so high is that the demand for corn has grown because of the de demand for ethanol. Um, could we all be driving hydrogen cars? Um, it's not likely to happen, in my view, because hydrogen's not an energy source. We've got to make it from something. And the cheapest way to make it is from fossil fuels. We can make it from water, but then that requires the application of electrical energy. And where do we get the extra electricity? So if we can run cars directly on electricity, we can bypass the hydrogen. All we need is a better battery. With hydrogen cars, we need several technological breakthroughs. With uh, better battery cars, we just need one, better batteries. Well, so we're headed toward higher oil prices. Uh, why have I spent so long just on this one subject? Because we've created a civilization that runs on oil. This is not a trivial matter. Um, of course, our main use of oil is for transportation. And you could say that transportation drives everything else, quite literally. Um, planes, trains, automobiles, ships. H how much of what we see around us would be here if it weren't for uh, cheap transportation. The whole phenomenon of globalization that we've seen over the past couple of decades really has been based on cheap transport fuels. But we also use oil as uh, a uh, feedstock for producing all kinds of plastics and chemicals. 
perhaps the most disturbing aspect of this whole discussion is how dependent we are on oil for our food system. We've created a food system that is basically uses soil as a medium with which to grow crops from oil. For every calorie of food that we produce, we invest about 10 calories of fossil fuel energy in the US in the form of uh, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, crop inputs and outputs, fuel for tractors, for crop drying, for uh, crop storage, and so on. Uh, and as the uh, price of oil has increased over the past uh, few years, we've also seen a concurrent dramatic increase in the price of uh, particularly grain crops. This is just uh, wheat prices. Uh, up through early 2008. And as a result of that, we've seen food riots in poor countries in the world. This is a trend that is not about to reverse itself anytime soon. It's likely to grow much worse as time goes on because all of the factors feeding into this trend are long-term factors that are, are actually worsening as time goes on. Just within the last couple of weeks, I've had opportunity to have some discussions with um, <clears throat> uh, an executive from Boeing and the uh, head of the uh, air transport division at the World Bank over the implications of all of this for uh, air travel. And these gentlemen are very worried. They take, they take this discussion quite seriously, and they're seeing what's happening to the uh, air transport industry right now. I mentioned earlier that uh, the uh, airlines are gr grounding planes. Uh, well, what does this mean for Boeing, for example? I mean, if, uh, if airlines have no use for the planes they already have, how likely are they to be uh, wanting or needing or able to uh, buy lots more planes? It's, it's pretty grim business. Boeing is looking at a future of producing super efficient uh, airliners and uh, on one hand and um, military aircraft on the other uh, but their their civilian aircraft uh, division is likely to shrink pretty dramatically even just within the next few years uh, basically we're looking at uh, a return of the jet set you know in the 1950s only the wealthy few were able to get on airplanes and fly around and everybody else took the bus or drove. We were just a less mobile society. We didn't travel as much or as far. Uh, and we're going to be that way again. Now, one could even argue that peak oil could mean the end of economic growth as we've known it because we've based economic growth to a very large extent on cheap energy, not just for transportation, but for manufacturing and distribution and just about everything else. Energy isn't a part of the economy. Energy is the basis for the entire economy. Without energy, nothing happens. The entire economy grinds to a standstill. So if we have less energy in the future, the only way we'll be able to maintain economic growth is if we're able to increase the efficiency of our use of energy faster than the rate of depletion of energy resources. That may be possible, but it's going to be one heck of a horse race. That's why uh, the chief economist of the International Energy Agency is now telling us that we must leave oil before it leaves us. We've got to get out ahead of the depletion curve. If we can reduce demand for oil voluntarily, that will keep prices under control. That will enable us to uh, reduce our vulnerability to oil supply shocks while we transition. And the transition process is going to take a while. It's not something we can do overnight. Yes, we all could be riding in electric cars, but the reality is that not everybody buys a new car every year. It's going to take Detroit several years to get those cars on, in the dealerships, assuming Detroit can even survive in, in the interim. And then it'll take about 15 to 20 years at current rates for people to junk their old cars and buy new ones and replace the current fleet. So that's about a 25-year strategy. Just about everything that we can do to solve this problem of peak oil has at least a 15 to 25-year uh, lead time, except for one thing. 
and that is behavior change. If people can uh, you know, start working at home rather than commuting, if people can uh, start growing more of their own food in their backyards rather than uh, buying food that has been trucked or uh, air freighted in from hundreds and thousands of miles away, that immediately cuts demand just by behavior change. Of course, we started this whole discussion talking about non-renewable resources, and oil is by far not the only non-renewable resource that's, that's depleting. Uh, this is just a list of some interesting ones, uh, interesting because they all relate to the computer industry in one way or another. Many of them relate to photovoltaics, which is one of the, the uh, uh, technologies that we're going to be relying on to make up for fossil fuels as time goes on. Everything from antimony to zinc. Okay, so that's axiom four, and I would just, uh, in closing out the discussion of, uh, of non-renewable resources, and particularly energy resources, uh, just want to mention uh, that uh, I, I read yesterday about Google.org's uh, plan to uh, uh, invest uh, $4 trillion. I don't think that's $4 trillion of company money, but uh, for, for the country as a whole, if we could invest $4 trillion along the lines advised, we could get off of fossil fuels by 2030. I think it's a very interesting plan, and it's good that uh, more of us are thinking along those lines. Axiom 5 is the uh, pollution axiom. Uh, sustainability requires that substances introduced into the environment from human activities be minimized and rendered harmless to biosphere functions. And of course, um, we've been polluting our environment for a very long time, and it's, it's not just about fossil fuels. Um, for example, um, uh, hunters and gatherers tan uh, the uh, leather of animals they kill, so they can t tanned hides are, are very useful. They, they last a lot longer. They're more, not only more durable, but they have other uh, more supple and, and easier to, to use. But tanning is something that requires a, you know, a process. Now, you can tan hides with the, the brains of the animal that, uh, that you've killed. Uh, another way is to use tanning agents like um, tan oak which of course gets its name from, from the tannic acid in, uh, in the leaves and bark. Well, um, <clears throat> if you're doing it on a small scale, it's, it's not that big a deal. But uh, when uh, European settlers arrived, for instance, in California and saw that, that the natives were using this tan oak as a tanning agent to tan hides, they decided they could do the same thing and started a le leather tanning industry. And the tannic acid, a runoff from, from these uh, factories basically killed all of, the, all of the streams that were downstream of, uh, of um, their operations. So here you have a perf you know, perfectly natural substance, uh, tannic acid from oak trees, but it's being concentrated in a way uh, and released into the environment that it results in, uh, in environmental disruption. Well, of course, uh, as we've increased our population, as we've increased our consumption habits, as, as we've increased our extraction of non-renewable resources and release of their waste products, we have been altering the environment in much more fundamental and widespread ways uh, than ever before. And the, the most serious of these has to do with the release of uh, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere and uh, the resulting climate change. This is clearly the most serious environmental crisis in our history as a species. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the de details of that, so I won't go into, the, into them in any, uh, uh, and take your time with that. I would just point out that <clears throat> um, it's also a problem of fossil fuels, just as the problem of peak oil, peak coal, and peak gas is a, a problem of, of fossil fuels. So our necessary strategy as a society over, over the course of the next uh, two, three decades has to be to get ourselves off of fossil fuels as quickly as possible, whatever our motive. Now, in, in my view, 
um, I think efforts to combat climate change are likely to come into, uh, are, are likely to hit some brick walls in the, in the fairly near future. As, um, <clears throat> as we see the true economic cost of carbon capture and storage, for example, I think that the likelihood is that that technology won't be deployed. Societies are going to be desperate for energy to maintain their economic activities, to maintain economic growth. And I think efforts to deal with climate change are going to be easily and quickly tossed overboard in that rush to maintain uh, economic viability. Depletion of fossil fuels, I think, is going to be a, a key argument uh, in, in this discussion because we're, as the efforts are, are proposed to, you know, for example, solve our oil supply problems in North America simply by drilling more, um, <clears throat> it's going to become obvious very quickly that that's not solving anything. And the only way, ultimately, to deal with our oil supply problem is to reduce demand. Well, as it turns out, that's also the only way we're going to deal with the problem of climate change is to reduce the demand for fossil fuels. So these, the, the solution for these two problems is essentially the same, but I think the argument from the, uh, from the depletion side is ultimately going to be more persuasive. I don't think policymakers are as likely to uh, uh, make their policies on the basis of the welfare of other species and future generations when push comes to shove as they are on the basis of immediate economic survival, which is what uh, the, the problem that, will, that depletion will pre be presenting for us. So um, just to sum up, um, sustainability is not optional. It's not just about you know, being good, green citizens. We're talking about survival. Unless we as a society can adopt sustainable practices with regard to all resources, both renewable and non-renewable, we will not survive as a society. Uh, and something to remember with regard to this is, uh, is a, an ecological principle first formulated all the way back in the 1860s by a soil scientist named Justice von Liebig. It's called Liebig's Law, or the Law of the Minimum. Basically, it says that carrying capacity is set by the single factor that is most out of balance. Now, wh what does this mean? Suppose we have an Af African violet here, a plant. Uh, what does it take to kill that African violet? Do we have to get everything wrong? You know, too much water, not enough water, wrong soil pH, too much sunlight, not enough sunlight. All of those things happening at once? No, just one thing. Just not enough water or wrong soil pH or any of the other factors that that plant needs. All it takes is one thing to go wrong, significantly wrong and the plant dies. Same thing with civilization. It's not going to require you know, every environmental factor going haywire at the same time, all it, it will take is one to send us over the edge into societal collapse. Second takeaway is the new, new paradigm for success is going to be using less. If uh, <clears throat> axioms two and three regarding renewable and non-renewable resources are true, then the only way we're going to survive as a society in the 21st century is to find a way to use less of just about everything. And that's also going to mean we're going to, there's going to have to be fewer of us, too. We're going to have to start taking population seriously. Uh, I know there, there's a huge political component to that discussion, but just because it's inconvenient or unpopular to talk about it, doesn't mean that we can get away with ignoring it. Population has to be part of the discussion. We're going to have to start sourcing materials more locally and, in fact, building more localized economies. If, in fact, globalization was based on cheap transport fuels, that means that the future is going to be a much more localized future. And that has some good aspects to it. You know, we gave up a lot in the process of globalization in terms of 
local, regional, national manufacturing capability, self-sufficiency, and so on, it could actually be very good for us to relocalize our production. Clearly, if fossil fuels, if the, if the project of getting off of fossil fuels is central to our survival, we have to bring that down to cases in everything we do. Look for the fossil fuel inputs everywhere in absolutely everything we're doing and reduce them continually, not just do it once and forget about it, but then do it and find ways to do more constantly. And then finally, we have to prepare ourselves psychologically, socially, politically for a century that's going to be very, very different from the century in which we all grew up. You know, the 20th century was all about more, bigger, faster. The 21st century is not going to look the same way. The, uh, the 21st century is the, the century of limits, where we find, we, we finally come up against basic resource limits, and we learn to live within them. Uh, if we don't, then that's the end of us. You know, we can solve this problem, or we can let nature solve the problem, and nature has ways of doing it, but they're probably not going to be to our liking. So the 21st century is going to be a century when <clears throat> we, we learn to live with less, when we learn to uh, value other things than we have learned to value in the 20th century. You know, during the 20th century, we, we developed more and more wants and desires. And this was not a, a natural process. It was, it was fueled by the advertising industry. And, and in the process, we became consumers rather than citizens, rather than human beings. We became consumers. Well, um, we need to think more of ourselves as members of communities, uh, members of families, as, uh, as contributors, as creators, and much less as consumers as time goes on. And in doing so, I think we'll be much happier as people. We, there are lots of opportunities in this process of adaptation, just as in the Great Depression. You know, there was enormous human suffering and hardship. We had to do with a lot less. And yet, the effort was uh, uh, very much a collective effort in, in which many people found meaning. And we ended up building new infrastructure in the country that we're still using, post offices and bridges and on and on. And many people who are still alive, who lived through that period of time, look back on it as some of the best times in their life. So um, if you'd like to know more about uh, our work at Post Carbon Institute, this is how you can uh, find us on the web. Uh, I also have a personal website, richardheinberg.com. And um, I'd be happy to uh, engage in conversation. Thanks. Um, if I could advise one policy for the next administration, first day in office, it would be to use this current financial crisis as an opportunity to entirely shift the priorities of the country. You know, we're, we are going to have to do something about the national economy. It's very clear. We can't just, you know, uh, pretend that this financial collapse isn't, isn't happening. But the question is, you know, do we take a trillion dollars and shovel it at Wall Street? Or do we uh, rebuild the economy from the ground up? We need new infrastructure in this country, energy production infrastructure, but also the infrastructure by which we, we use energy, new electricity grid, new transportation networks, and so on. That's going to require investment, but that investment is going to create new jobs. It will has, has the capability of rebuilding the economy from the ground up. And I, I think if, uh, if a new president grasps that opportunity, then uh, there's, there's the possibility of, of turning this crisis into, um, into a rebirth and opportunity for the whole country. Yeah.
Yes. Yes, well, how much, uh, what's the size of population the Earth can sustain over long term? A, a number of people have tried to calculate that. And of course, it depends on what kind of technology you assume that people are using and, and so on. Uh, the most optimistic, well, let's see. There, there are people like Julian Simon, the late economist, who have proposed that the Earth could sustain population in the range of tens of billions. Uh, there, those of us who have ecological backgrounds think that's very unrealistic. And among people who, who do have a background in ecology, the most optimistic uh, estimates that I've seen are in the range of one to two billion humans over long term. Now, we could get down to 1 to 2 billion humans by 2100 if we had a policy of you know, one child per family, zero to one child per family. And over the course of, of the next uh, you know, nine decades, we could, we could actually achieve a population of, of, of 1 billion. We'll see, if, uh, we'll see if we do that. Yes. Yes. Was I su surprised at the speed with which this uh, transition's happening? You know, <clears throat> um, mentally, no, because, you know, I, I, with my colleagues, we've been looking at the same set of data for 10 years now. And, um, and it's, it's been clear, consistently clear in that data, that the world would ha start having severe problems with um, oil supply within a couple of years of, of 2010. So starting to see prices go up you know, exponentially around this time was no surprise at the mental level. But at, at the sort of visceral level, you know, to actually see the economy shudder and start to collapse, to watch the airlines consolidating and Ford and GM and Chrysler talking about bankruptcy, I mean, the, the, it's... Uh, there, there, there's no way you can look at the uh, at, at changes of that scale and magnitude in the world that we all live in and take for granted, without feeling queasy and frightened and and all the rest. Right, a uh, question about oil speculation. Isn't that, isn't that really a symptom of peak oil? Yes, absolutely. Of course, uh, partly it's people who had been invested in other things looking for a safe haven for their, their capital and seeing that commodities might be a, you know, a, a good place to put their money. But then you know, why would oil look like a good bet in that case? Well, if you see that demand is increasing and supply isn't, well, any, any intelligent investor is going to see that as an opportunity. And so it's natural that uh, speculative capital would flow in that direction. Yeah, you're right. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Well, good. Thanks for uh, being here during this past, uh, what is it, 45 minutes, hour, or something like that. Um, I've appreciated the opportunity to share these thoughts. I hope we can take them forth into our work and home lives and make a difference. Thanks a lot.